By now, most of us would have heard about the death of South Africa's anti-apartheid icon, Archbishop Desmond Tutu. He died last week. Before his death, he had requested that his body be disposed of in the most eco-friendly manner possible and that he should be placed and displayed in the most inexpensive and eco-friendly kind of coffin that was available. And that is exactly what happened after he died. The body of the Archbishop was displayed in a cheap wooden casket and after that he was cremated. His cremation took place through the process of aquamation or water cremation. In this video, we'll talk about how bodies are cremated in liquids in water cremation and how it is different from other forms of cremation and disposal of dead bodies. I'm Sandhya Ramesh and this is Pure Science. Traditionally, when someone passes away, they are either buried or cremated in most cultures. The former is self-explanatory and cremation is of two kinds now. We do have the open-air pyres where post-funeral rites are performed on wood. But nowadays, we also see a lot of closed furnaces or cremators in the form of electric crematoria. The process of cremation itself dates back to nearly 19,000 years. The Mungo Woman 1 is one of three remains found at Lake Mungo in Australia and it is the world's oldest known example of a cremation. There was also a Mungo Man 3 who was discovered a few years later who became the oldest Homo sapiens to ever be found on the Australian continent dating to 40,000 years ago, but there was no evidence that he was cremated. The Mungo Lady or Mungo Woman 1 was partly cremated at least and then her remains were buried. This process of cremation followed by burial was in fact typically followed by many civilizations around the world. There has been evidence of both throughout most parts of the world. In the Indian subcontinent, cremation was first observed anthropologically in Cemetery H culture dated to around 1900 BCE, which includes the Harappan region. The culture here is thought to be a part of the late chapter of Harappan culture and eventually became the Vedic civilization. In Europe, the rise of Christianity and the concept of resurrection of the Christ's body led to a decline in cremation and an increase in cemeteries which can actually be tracked through history. In the Middle Ages, cremation started to become outlawed and used as a punishment in Europe for non-believers. This included the process of burning people at the stake. But by the late 1800s, there started to appear the need to dispose of bodies without the spread of disease. That is when cremation made a comeback in Europe little by little once again. The same is true for Africa as well. For the past few centuries, a majority of the countries in Africa have been using cemeteries and graves, but cremation is now seeing a rise once again because of increasing poverty and lack of space. Many nations that are still in the low-income bracket see large numbers of people occupying slums and crowding in spaces. Additionally, just like many other cultures, use the funeral to symbolize a person moving on and include food and drinks. Many African cultures too have funeral practices that span several days like the Hindu culture does and include lavish food and alcohol. Much like the Hindu culture, it is often also a ceremony that involves some form of celebration. In fact, a snippet of such a ceremony we've seen is in the famous meme video Coffin Dance where pall bearers or casket carriers in Ghana dance during a funeral. Owing to rising costs and lack of space as well as decline in orthodox religion, cremation is seeing a fast rise in Africa. Nobel laureate and environmental activist Vangari Mathai was cremated in 2011 in a very high-profile cremation. Then in 2018, one of Kenya's wealthiest men and former presidential candidate, Kenneth Matiba, underwent a cremation. And now in 2021-22, it's Archbishop Desmond Tutu. He passed away on the 26th of December and his body was cremated through aquamation. 
Aquamation isn't necessarily actual cremation inside the water. There's no burning of flesh. Instead, the process that actually takes place in a water cremation is called alkaline hydrolysis. The process was developed nearly 150 years ago, back in 1888, by a British man called Amos Herbert Hobson, who patented it. It was used to process animal carcasses after lab experimentation and the remains to be used as a fertilizer. Since then, the process has been used to dispose of animal cadavers. In the 1990s, it was used to dispose of cattle that was infected with the mad cow disease and infected pigs that died from other diseases. Then it started to be used just for pet cadaver disposal. Soon, aquamation found use in funeral homes where it started to be called biocremation and in medical schools where it is used to dispose of donated human cadavers. The very first commercial machine for alkaline hydrolysis was manufactured only as recently as in 2005. The process that the body undergoes during alkaline hydrolysis is just a sped up version of the decomposition that happens when the body is buried. The body is first placed into a high pressure tank which is filled with water and potassium hydroxide or lye. Potassium hydroxide here is a strong alkaline agent. The temperature in this container is then raised to 150 to 160 degrees Celsius. This heat then starts to degrade the flesh and organs, but the high pressure inside keeps the liquid from boiling. So what ends up happening is that in anywhere from 3 to 4 to 5 hours, the dead body is completely liquefied except for the bones. All skin, hair, organs, flesh, muscle, fat, blood, everything is turned into very fine mush. The bones that remain are completely bleached and they are then laid out and dried in a large oven and then subsequently compacted to dust. This dust is then stored or scattered depending on personal preferences. The white ash looks slightly different from what is left over after flame cremation, which tends to have chips or fragments. But aquamation bone dust is fine and very powdery. Once this process is completed, it is very easy to dispose of the waste, which in fact is the biggest benefit to this process. The liquefied remains can be safely removed into sewage through drains and has a high nutrient content. The dissolved solution looks like beer and contains a mix of about 96% water and 4% acids, completely sterile and without any human DNA. So it's perfectly safe and free of disease. The liquid is often dumped down sewage lines or used as fertilizer, which was the original intention for which the method was even invented in the first place. Additionally, the process is greener and much more eco-friendly than any other kind of cremation processes that we follow today. Firstly, implants that burn in flame or get disfigured don't do so in this process. So, metallic implants like hip implants or breast implants and even teeth fillings that contain mercury don't burn. When mercury burns, it causes harm to our lungs. But the aquamation process preserves these implants and in a lot of cases, these implants can actually be reused. The process also uses 90% less energy when compared to fire and also utilizes no wood. Totally, it is thought to be about only a tenth of the carbon footprint of traditional flame cremation. The process is not legal in many places just yet and for various reasons. The technology is relatively new and hasn't seen such a widespread uptick in its use just yet. Countries that are primarily comprised of cultures that bury instead of cremate ban it for religious and sentimental reasons as well. And even in countries where cremation is the default practice, often struggle to let go of cremation practices that don't involve the traditional firewood. However, as global citizens become more and more aware of eco-friendly alternatives to our important practices, 
Biocremation or water cremation or aquamation is all set to rise in demand and in practice. The Archbishop too has played a vital role in it as well we're talking about it today. His own body lay in a cheap coffin for a few days and was then acclimated and his crushed bone remains will be interred or placed in a grave in St. George's Cathedral in Cape Town where he served as the Archbishop for 35 years.